I'm here because I lost my son Elvis to fentanyl. He was a mama's boy. He really loved me. He really loved his family. He loved our dogs. He loved hanging out with his grandpa, riding dirt bikes, um, doing stuff my dad would do with him. He just loved being active with my dad. Um, he was a goof, a goof. He liked to joke around, very silly. He was very unique, um, very funny, very as outgoing, but also very private. He was good at making friends, but he was also, he kept a circle small. He was, he was social when he needed to be. He liked to dance and sing. Goofy dancing. I mean, not seriously dancing, but, like, it's, you know, he liked the song. He danced to it. Even if he knew that it wasn't good, he'd sing to songs, too, even if he knew he didn't sing good. He just still did it. I didn't stop him. He was just himself. He, he, he always did his own thing. He never wanted to ever do what anybody else wanted him to do, like school. He was the kind of person, if you asked him to do something, he would do the opposite. You know, I don't think it was consciously, but that was just his personality, you know, to dancing to the beat of his own drummer, you might say. As he got older, he definitely became more focused. I mean, he had a job when he turned 16 or whatever, and he always went to work. He was really committed to going to work and being responsible. In fact, like the day after he died, he was supposed to start a new job. And he was really excited about that because he was going to be making more money and staying more busy. So he was a worker. He definitely had issues. He had a lot of anxiety at times. Um, depression, not super motivated for school, things like that. He wasn't really concerned about that. You know, we had him, his dad and I got divorced, and so that was a big deal for him because he was like five when that happened. So that really affected him more than I even knew, you know. Um, so that was definitely an issue. But he got by. We got through. I mean, we worked on the issues, you know, did what we could. He tells me that when he was 12 or so, he was smoking pot, which I didn't know, of course. When he got into high school, ninth grade, things escalated. Of course, I didn't know how much because kids don't tell you what they're doing. He overdosed on alcohol and Valium um, in the park before school at seven in the morning. Um, he told me he was going to school, but he was actually going to the, to the park and hang out with kids. Thank God somebody called the ambulance and he ended up being okay. He, he recovered. It was fine. But of course that was scary. So scary at the time, I didn't even know how to feel. It hadn't even entered my mind that I would ever lose my child. So to have him intubated in the hospital at that time was just horrifying. Like, I, I didn't even know how to feel, if that makes sense, because it had never entered my mind that I would lose him. You don't ever think you're going to lose your child. And I know, you know, I lost my sister. I lost my best friend. And my feeling about my sister, losing my sister, you know, I was, towards my mom, us other kids were like, well, you still have us. Get over it, kind of. You know what I mean? Because it's not your child. And now that I'm on the, and my sister was an addict, so I kind of like blamed her. How could you do this to us? You know, but when it's your own child, now I know, unfortunately, you don't feel that way, <laughs> you know, um, 
it's it's rough. So he he had that incident when he was like 13 or 14. He was in and out of drugs. He went to rehab um, probably about a year before he died, maybe two years. I can't remember exactly how long it was. So he was doing pretty well after that. He hadn't gotten bad, like when he was bad before he went to rehab, stumbling around, getting arrested, things like that. He really improved when he came back. So, I mean, that's, he wasn't perfect. He smoked a lot of weed, you know, but weed doesn't kill you, I guess. Now maybe it does. Um, and he wasn't doing terrible when he decided to buy these freaking pills (laughs) that killed him. We met in uh, high school. I was a sophomore, and he was a freshman. Um, yeah, we he started hanging out with my friend group, and I remember I liked his shoes. He had these uh, these Vans checkered black and white shoes, and I was like, I really like your shoes. And he was like, thanks. And I got them not too long after that. And I was like, hey, we're matching shoes now. And we kind of just created a friendship from that. Um, and then we we dated not very long. We dated for a couple months, and he we broke up because he actually overdosed um, on Valium and vodka. And he, uh, yeah, he overdosed. He had to be sent to the hospital, and his parents thought it would be best to send him to Florida to go live with his grandparents to kind of get away from everything. So then we split up for a couple years and then got back together um, August of 2020. And we're together all the way up until April 7th when he passed away. So when we got back together, it was a couple months after he actually had gotten out of rehab and um, mental hospital too. He was taking like ecstasy type. Um, I can't remember exactly what it's called off the top of my head, uh, but he was taking that and he ended up, I don't really know the full story to it, but he, he got sent to rehab. He was there for six months all together with rehab and the mental hospital. And he came out and he, he wanted a, a fresh start. So we got back together and I, I tried to do my best to keep him because he knew that I didn't like that stuff. I never liked doing anything. So I was, I was kind of his rock as he referred to me, kind of kept him grounded. It was his last day of his job. And then he was going to have the next day off and then start the next day, his, his new job. So I think maybe it was just like a little celebratory thing. And I know his friends said, Oh, he said, you want to hang out with me tonight? And his friends, for whatever reason, couldn't. And he told me, he said, mom, can I get 20 bucks, um, to go hang out with my friend Chaz? And I was, yeah, gave him 20 bucks. Um, I saw him leaving the house. He came home and I thought he was drinking. I mean, he was acting messed up. I was like, what is wrong with you? But I wasn't, he's 18. If he's drinking, it's his last day of work. You know, you think that's not that outrageous for an 18 year old. I made him unload the dishwasher And, uh, he went into his room and I heard him talking to his girlfriend and didn't think we went to bed. And so the next day I got up and went to the gym. I was off that day. My husband was there and he was, I said, have you seen Elvis? No, he hadn't come out. I'm like, that's weird. Cause he usually at least comes out to go to the bathroom. But I also thought he probably stayed up late. So I didn't think much of it. He had an appointment with a drug counselor that afternoon, and I, we had to be there at 3 or something, and it was about 12. And he doesn't sleep like that. He he wouldn't. But I also didn't think that was that outrageous. He's 18, maybe he's sleeping in. And I went into the room at 1230, and there he was, dead in the bed. The most horrifying moment of my entire life. I felt what I—it felt like my soul left my body. I'm a nurse. I'm a hospice nurse. <laughs> I know a dead person when I see one. I didn't have to do CPR like these people do on their on their dead person. Um, 
it I'll never forget that moment I, just to feel <laughs> I just it was horrifying horrifying worst day ever he he started hanging around some a couple people who um were doing perks and he kept it a secret from me for as long as he could and then I eventually found out because he knew he knew that I would be upset with it and you know would try to get on him about it um and he told me he wasn't doing it like maybe every once in a while he would which in the back of my head I didn't really believe that because he 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 thought that he was a good liar to me but I I could tell when he was lying um, so it kind of started to, things started to get rocky. He started doing some things, smoking a lot more. He was, he was actually on, um, probation, so he wasn't even allowed to smoke anymore. That's when things kind of started. I think that's when it started. He was on probation, he was getting drug tested, and he wasn't allowed to smoke. So he resorted to other things to kind of ease his mind. I stayed the night at his house because I was working like five minutes away from him. So I stayed the night and I went to work. Everything was fine. He had texted me while I was at work and asked me for $20. And I saw it, but I couldn't respond because I was like, dude, it's you don't need $20 that bad. Like, I'm going to respond later. And then he texted me and he was like, never mind. I got the $20. And I was like, what do you need it for? And he was like, oh, I'm just, I'm going to go buy weed for my friend. And I was like... Okay, that's that's believable enough. I mean, his... So, we kind of... We usually... We talked a lot. We we talked a lot throughout the day. And um, he kind of wasn't responding to me as much. And I have really bad anxiety. So, I had started, like, sensing... So I was like, something's not right. Like, he's up to something and he's not telling me. And we ended up calling later in the night. And I was like, dude, like, what's going on? Like, you're you're being kind of secretive for me. And he was like, oh, I didn't do anything. I just, I went down to the park and I, I got some weed and I hung out with my friend and I just came back home. It was like, I just had some drinks too. And I was like, I still felt like something wasn't right. So I really kept pushing into it. And I was like, there's just, I was like, I just feel like you're lying to me. I was like, are you cheating on me? Like, is that what it is? And he, he was like, no, I'm not cheating on you. And we ended up getting off the phone and I still just, like, I had this feeling. I was like, something is not right. And I just kept texting him. And I was like, what's going on? Like, can you talk to me? Like, I I feel like you're cheating on me. You're doing something you're not supposed to do. Like, my mind is going to so many different places. And he was like, I'm not doing anything. And I just kept texting him. And I was just like, I'm sorry. Like, I'm, I'm sorry. My anxiety is just so bad. I just want need to make sure you're okay. And he ended up, I saw on the text message that it was red. And he never responded after that. And I kept texting. And I figured he he might have gotten upset and just didn't want to respond. So I I was up the whole night anxious, but I went to bed. And I went to work the next morning. He's usually up before me. He usually yells at me to get up in the morning. And I have, I didn't hear from him. So I went to my first shift of the day. And I got off about 12, and I still hadn't heard from him, which was not normal. So I called him, and his mom answered. And I said, what's going on? And she said, the worst thing you could imagine. And I said, what what happened? And she said, he's dead. And I, at this time, I was working with patients, and I was outside of the house, and I just lost it. I knew he was dead, but I um, didn't want them to come right away because I knew they, would, they wouldn't let me in there and they would want it, you know, so I wanted to spend some time with them before they came. And I actually called my friend who's a hospice nurse. I said, what do I do, you know? And she's like, you got to call 911. And I said, okay. So I did after a while. I didn't, I didn't want to have them come rushing over. And, and actually, I, his phone was sitting there on the table when I I saw that there was messages and things coming through and I tried to put it up to his face (laughs) to unlock it and it didn't work, but then it rang and it was Alexis. 
And I was like, are you sitting down? Where are you? And then I told her and it was not good. 911 came and they made me get out of the room and they wanted to investigate everything and they did and then they took him out. That was the last time I saw him at home and then I saw him at the funeral home because we wanted to have a viewing just for us close family members and I mean... You never want to see your child dead. <laughs> it's just unbelievable. And there's so many of us, you know, thank God I have a support group of all these other parents in the same situation. You're dead in the bed. I mean, that's such a common thing. The kid does whatever and that's it. Lights out. So they, they did a... Um, you know, like a preliminary autopsy, like within days, they said it was fentanyl. I mean, they didn't have all the exact um, numbers or how much it was, but it was acute fentanyl intoxication. I had heard a little bit about it, but not, I had no idea it was like this. I mean, and shortly after another kid in town died, um, it was a surprise, but it wasn't a surprise once I heard, and then I looked it up and I was like, this is, oh my God, this is out of control. Why haven't I heard about this? He knew about fentanyl. He knew that it was in, that's, that's the thing is he knew that a lot of the people in our town, um, that sold perks, he knew that they were fake first of all, and he knew that a lot of them contained fentanyl. They started an investigation right away, and we basically knew that he got it off Snapchat and basically know exactly who he got it from. Um, but that person is not in custody. They can't find him. There is a warrant. It's not for, you know, drug-induced homicide or anything. They are investigating it, but I guess until they get this kid, they I don't know. I don't know. It's so weird in California, but they say there's an investigation, but it's not on the charges. It's selling, you know, drugs is on his charges, um, but they can't do anything because they don't have him. Not that that's going to, it's just a losing situation for everyone involved. I mean, this kid's life's going to be ruined. My kid's life obviously is gone. Uh, it's just this whole thing with this fentanyl is horrible. There's no winner. <laughs> you know, I, I, as much as I would love to have some kind of justice, it's not going to bring my son back. The lesson for people is you cannot experiment. You can't Take a chance. It's a different world. This is a different world we live in. There's no being a kid and being stupid and making a bad mistake. It's one thing to take drugs and, I don't know, act a fool. or It's quite another now. Take a pill and die almost instantly. You can't do it. I mean, they say test, you know, um, harm reduction, which, okay, if you have to do your drugs for whatever, you at least got to test it, but you can't trust anything you get. No way. Unless it's from your doctor with your name on it. Yeah. And kids think they're invincible and they think it's not going to happen to them. It's not going to happen to me. Because that's the way you think when you're 15, 16, 17. You don't have the wherewithal to understand that, yes, this definitely can happen to you. So don't do drugs is basically the takeaway for me. The first six months was definitely very hard, but the first year in general, it took me a long time to kind of pick myself back up and keep going. It's kind of just showed me that life can be short and to appreciate, you know, your loved ones everything you have to really appreciate it it's made me a lot stronger too um which took me a long time to accept that because I've heard from everyone in my family you know you're so strong you're so strong and I never felt strong you know I there was times that I just 
I didn't want to do it anymore. You know, I, it was hard. I lost the only boyfriend I've ever had. You know, it was my first kiss. It was my first a lot of things. And it was, it was really hard. I mean, it still is hard, but it's also made me appreciate things more. And, you know, I, I keep going because I know that he, 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 we've actually had to talk about what would happen if one of us died. And I'm doing exactly what he told me to do, to, to keep going and to live my life, do everything that I wanted to do. And that's, I'm, I'm doing it for him. I wish I could have my son back. I wish this didn't happen. I wish that, you know, I have another son, so I have to keep going. But it's terrible. This is the most terrible thing that could happen to a human person is to lose their child. And until it happens to you, you don't get that. <laughs> and I'm, I'm happy for people who don't get it. I'm in a parent support group um, for people who have lost their children. And it's all, we're all fentanyl. <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's, um, so I have them to support me. I don't, you know, go out in the community like Jeanette is doing. Like, you know, I don't feel motivated so much to do that, but to have the support of the other parents, because it's like, we know no one gets this. You don't get it. You know, if your kid is not dead, you don't understand. You, you, people, are you over it? You're never going to be over it. You live with it for the rest of your life. You li I live every day. I wake up I think about my son and I think about my son all day and I think about my son when I go to sleep and I'm going to think about him for the rest of my life, you know? <laughs>